Thank you for joining for the Disorders of Hemostasis lecture for the Hematology and Oncology unit of the General Medicine course. Please be sure to have your study guide ready so you can fill that out as you watch this lecture. Please continue to the next slide to begin. The learning objectives for this lecture are listed here for you. Please be sure you are familiar with these topics so you can be prepared for the exam. Today we'll be discussing hemostasis, which means the stopping of blood. Hemostasis is divided into two different portions, the primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Primary hemostasis will occur first and immediately following an injury, you will have vasoconstriction of the vessels, so contraction of the vessels trying to control that bleeding. Also in primary hemostasis, the platelets will start to be activated due to that injury and they will begin to collect together and aggregate they also have von Willebrand factors that are involved in this, which help the platelets to better adhere together and start forming platelet um, bridges to try and stop that bleeding. You also will see secondary hemostasis, and this is the portion that involves factors of coagulation. And the end of this path would be involving fibrinogen, also known as factor one, forming a fibrin clot. And you'll see here that the fibrin clot is listed as factor 1a, and what you will see with these factors, so you have factor one, and when it's in its active form, it'll be listed as factor 1a. If you had factor two and it's active, it'll be factor 2a, so on and so forth. So this is a common thing you'll see when you're talking about hemostasis as well. Hemostasis of, is also divided into three pathways. You'll see the extrinsic, the intrinsic, and then the common pathway. Those are the most common words that you'll see used for this. The extrinsic pathway can also be referred to as the tissue factor pathway. The intrinsic pathway can also be referred to as the contact activation pathway. And the common pathway is sometimes referred to as the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway. So these pathways will start off separately and then meet in a common pathway. And we'll be discussing that in the slides coming up. The tissue factor pathway, also known as the extrinsic pathway. This clotting pathway involves external injury, so trauma outside of the blood vessels. In this pathway, you have factor 1, 2, 5, 7, and 10. And of those factors, 1, 2, 5, and 10 are part of the common pathway. So the only factor in the extrinsic pathway that is not in the common pathway is factor seven. Below you'll see the steps written out in words for the extrinsic pathway, and I'm gonna draw them here first to help with understanding them. So we'll start off with factor seven, and then it will lead to the common pathway, which will start with factor 10, followed by factor five, followed by factor two, and followed by factor one. So let's discuss this a little bit. The tissue factor extrinsic pathway is activated by some sort of external injury. So there's injury to the site, and this will cause a collection of tissue factors. These tissue factors will cause activation of factor seven, and factor seven will become factor seven A. When factor seven A is active, is active, you will have factor 10 become 10 A, and factor 10 A will cause you to have factor five activated. This will cause the formation of prothrombinase, which will cause factor two, which is prothrombin, to become active in its form 2A, which is thrombin. When thrombin is present, it causes fibrinogen, which is factor one, to become factor 1A, which is the fibrin clot. This system is assessed by the prothrombin time, which is also called the PT. Next, we'll discuss the contact activation pathway, also known as the intrinsic pathway. This pathway involves trauma within the blood vessel to lead to clotting. The factors in this pathway are factor one, two, five, eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Again, the common pathway will have factors one, two, five, and 10. So the factors that are only found in the contact activation pathway and not in the common pathway are factors 8, 9, 11, and 12. The steps in the pathway are written out in words for you below, but I will also draw out 
some of the parts of the pathway. We'll start with factor 12, which will lead to factor 11, which will lead to factor 9, which will lead to factor 8, which will then lead to the common pathway with 10, 5, factor 2, and then factor 1. So what happens with this? You'll have activation due to different factors to factor 12. So 12 will become active. And the active 12 leads to the activation of 11, factor 9, and factor 8. These factors will come together, factor 9, 8, and they will also combine with factor 10 to make a tenase complex. And this causes factor 10 to become active. When you have an active factor 10, it follows back to that same pathway, the common pathway. So an active factor 10 will lead to activation of factor 5, which causes the formation of prothrombinase, which causes factor 2, which is also called prothrombin, to become thrombin. Once you have thrombin, this will cause fibrinogen factor 1 to become active and form the fibrin clot. The test to assess the contact activation or intrinsic pathway is the activated partial thromboplastin time, also called the APTT. Sometimes you'll see this written as just PTT. Now again, a review of the common pathway. This is the common portion of the cascade that involves both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, and it has factors 1, 2, 5, and 10. And as you remember, you have factor 10, factor 5, factor 2, and factor 1. Factor 10 will become active and will bind to factor 5. That causes prothrombinase to be formed, and prothrombinase will take prothrombin, factor 2, and convert it to factor 2A, which is thrombin. And then thrombin will cause fibrogen, fibrinogen, factor 1, to become fibrin clot. The entire pathway for secondary hemostasis is listed out here for you in the image. It involves both the extrinsic and extrinsic pathways and the common pathway. And this is a nice representation, but can be a little overwhelming. So on the next slide, I'll draw a simplified version for you. Now let's draw a simplified version of secondary hemostasis. We'll start off with the extrinsic pathway with factor seven which will lead into the start of the common pathway with factor 10, followed by five, followed by factor two, and followed by factor one. We'll outline this pathway. And we'll label it extrinsic pathway. And remember that this will be tested with your PT. Now let's draw out the intrinsic pathway. The intrinsic pathway will start with factor 12, which will lead to factor 11, which will lead to factor 9, which will lead to factor 8, and then it will lead into the common pathway. We'll outline this pathway here. And again, this is the intrinsic pathway, and it is tested with the APTT. Then let's make an outline of the common pathway, which is right here in the middle. So you can see where you have your common pathway. Next, we'll discuss taking a history and performing a physical exam for a patient with a bleeding issue or bleeding disorder. It's important to first look at any past history of bleeding. Important things to keep an eye out for would be things such as bleeding early on as a child or infant, which would suggest a genetic disorder. Bleeding that starts in adulthood would suggest more of a acquired disorder instead of something that is inherited. You also want to make sure that you look for other 
past history of bleeding. This would include dental procedures, obstetric history, gynecologic history, which includes the menstrual history, any post-surgical history of bleeding, was there any bleeding after circumcision in male patients, and any bleeding after trauma. Also in bleeding histories, it's important to take down any history of transfusions and how the patient tolerated those. Looking at family history of bleeding can be important for looking for genetic and inherited disorders. A medication history is very helpful when looking at bleeding because there are many medications that could cause excessive bleeding. The over-the-counter ones that are most common would be your non anti-inflammatories or chronic aspirin use. Bleeding can also be seen with SSRIs. This is because serotonin is involved in platelet aggregation. So when they're taking SSRIs, the um, decreased platelet activation can lead to bleeding. Certain antibiotics may be more prone to bleeding. The most common one would be tobermycin. Chemotherapeutics may lead to bleeding issues. And several herbal products should also be discussed with patients who are presenting with bleeding. Some of these include garlic, ginseng, and the two most common, vitamin E and fish oil. On physical exam, it's important to look for the type of bleeding, and bleeding is generally divided into two different types, mucocutaneous, meaning the skin or the mucous membranes, and these are more likely to be related to platelet issues, and so these are disorders of primary hemostasis. If you have bleeding of joints or soft tissues, these are more likely to be coagulation factor issues, which are disorders of secondary hemostasis. The laboratory testing for bleeding and clotting disorders includes a platelet count, a prothrombin time, or PT, an activated partial thromboplastin time, or an APTT, a thrombin time, or TT. There's also some specialized studies, which include mixing studies, factor assays, and platelet function analyzer. Platelet count. A normal platelet count is between 150 and 400 microliters. A platelet count less than 150 microliters is considered a thrombocytopenia. Please remember when you're looking at thrombocytopenias, it's really important to make sure you get a peripheral smear or doing a CBC in a sodium citrate tube, which is a blue tube, to rule out a pseudothrombocytopenia, which can be caused by the EDTA that is seen in the normal CBC purple tubes. Prothrombin time, activated partial thromboplastin time, and thrombin time. The prothrombin time, or PT, is used to screen the extrinsic pathway. This is reported as an INR, which is also known as an international normalized ratio, and is used for monitoring patients that are warfarin, also known as Coumadin. The normal INR for a patient who is anticoagulated with warfarin should be two to three, if the patient has a valve replacement, they should be at 2.5 to 3.5. Activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT. This is used to screen for the intrinsic pathway and is used to look at heparin therapy. If you have an abnormal PTT, it is important to make sure you also do a mixing study as a follow-up, and we'll discuss that on the next slide. Thrombin time, or a TT, this is looking at hypofibrinogenemia or other drugs that could cause problems in clotting. It also will look for fibrin split products, which is seen from different mechanical interference from fibrin polymerization. Mixing studies. If you have a patient with a prolonged APTT, you should do a mixing study. In a mixing study, you take the patient's plasma and mix it with normal plasma in a one-to-one -one ratio. If you have an APTT that corrects with a mixing study, you should be considering a factor deficiency. This is because you have mixed a normal plasma with a plasma that's missing a factor. And because that factor is now replaced by adding the normal plasma, the PTT will correct. If the APTT does not correct with a mixing study, then you should suspect a factor inhibitor. If you replace the patient's plasma with normal plasma, the inhibitor will still be present in the patient's plasma, and therefore it will still inhibit the factors. Therefore, the APTT does not correct. When evaluating a patient for bleeding, you should also consider doing a factor assay. 
This test actually looks for individual factors in the blood. These will also sometimes be referred to as coagulation factor tests, and they are completed when you have an abnormal PT and or an abnormal APTT, or when you cannot explain bleeding or bruising. There are also special assays for looking at von Willebrand factors, which we'll be discussing shortly. Another test that may be performed for abnormal bleeding or bruising is a platelet function analyzer. This is done for patients that have a bleeding disorder, but still have a normal platelet count, normal PT, and a normal PTT. This is used to look at the function of their platelets. This test is also useful in looking at von Willebrand's disease, which we will discuss in the coming slides. It's important to remember with a platelet function analyzer test that the hospital must draw the test right then and there and immediately bring it to the lab so that there isn't any excess co coagulation that occurs. Thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia is defined as a low platelet count. Typically, that's below 150,000. When you have less than 100,000, this is considered a clinically significant thrombocytopenia. If a patient is between 40 and 60,000, they are at high risk for a post-traumatic bleed, meaning that they have some injury causing bleeding. If they're less than 20,000, they could have spontaneous bleeding, and anything less than 5,000 is at risk for a life-threatening bleed. There are several causes of thrombocytopenia, and they are divided into three main groups. You can have decreased production of platelets, increased destruction of platelets, or increased sequestration of platelets. Decreased production of platelets are often due to issues with bone marrow or to different nutritional deficiencies. The increased destruction of platelets are listed below and we'll be talking about the highlighted ones. You can also see them with the transfusion reactions or it could be from cardiac valves or also we'll be talking about von Willebrand's disease and platelets. For sequestration, this is often due to some sort of hypersplenism, which means the spleen is overacting. There are some other cases where you can see gestational thrombocytopenia during pregnancy and some syndromes that involve low platelets. Next, we'll discuss thrombocytopenias due to increased platelet destruction. They are listed below ITP, DIC, TTP, HUS, and HIT. We'll discuss them on the next slides. Immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Immune thrombocytopenic purpura, or ITP. This is an autoimmune disorder caused by IgG antibodies binding to the platelets. The antibodies will lead to increased platelet destruction. Often this is an idiopathic issue. You can see this with other issues such as lupus, lymphoma, medications, HIV, or hepatitis. And most patients with ITP will pre present with mucosal or skin bleeding most common being epistaxis or nosebleeds, petechiae, purpura, or ecchymosis. And often you will see these patients with ITP have a normal spleen. If the patients do have splenomegaly, you should be thinking about other things such as malignancy. Laboratory findings in ITP. You'll see a thrombocytopenia on either the CBC or the peripheral smear. You do need to make sure that this is not a pseudothrombocytopenia, and this can be done by looking at the peripheral smear or by doing a sodium citrate tube for your CBC. On bone marrow, you will see increased megakaryocytes. It is important to do a bone marrow because you want to make sure that the megakaryocytes are increased and in trying to increase the platelets. This is a clue to tell you that this is a peripheral issue, meaning that it's a problem with destruction of platelets and not a problem with the bone marrow producing platelets. In ITP, you will have a normal PT and a normal APTT, and this is because this is a platelet issue and not a problem with the extrinsic or intrinsic clotting systems. Ultimately, your diagnosis for ITP will be made by getting a platelet-associated IgG antibody assay. And if this is positive, that will give you your diagnosis. ITP treatment. Patients with ITP should be treated by a hematologist. If a patient is being treated for ITP, they will likely not be treated unless they have a count below 20 to 30,000 or if they have significant bleeding. If the patients do require treatment, the first line treatments include prednisone therapy and high dose IVIG. There are some other options for treatment, possibly splenectomy if they do not respond to the prednisone. 
danazole, rituximab, or other options, and thrombopoietin will help to increase the production of platelets is another second line treatment. Sometimes patients with ITP will require platelet transfusions. This is only done in very severe life-threatening cases. And this is because the new platelets will not survive long. They will still be destructed by the antibodies. Disseminated intervascular coagulation, or DIC. There are three main parts to disseminated intervascular coagulation, or DIC. This involves uncontrolled coagulation, which is then followed by bleeding because of the depletion of clotting factors due to the coagulation, and later thrombocytopenia due to the consumption of platelets. So the three words you should think of for disseminated intervascular coagulation are coagulation followed by bleeding and then thrombocytopenia. This can be caused by several issues, the big ones being sepsis, malignancy, trauma, specifically burns, snake bites, or other toxins, and also can be seen peripartum, meaning at the time of delivery. This is often referred to as HELP syndrome, and it involves hemolysis, which is where the H comes from, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets, which is where the words HELP come from. This is seen around the time of delivery and can be a very severe form of DIC that has a very high mortality. DIC can be very medically challenging because it's really hard to identify because you have both clotting and bleeding. Disseminated intervascular coagulation has clinical features of both bleeding and thrombosis. It's common to see a patient having oozing from a site of a venipuncture or a wound. At the same time, you will also see microvascular thrombosis, which is distal ischemias, which could lead to gangrene. Laboratory findings in DIC. In DIC, you will see thrombocytopenia due to the use of the platelets. You will see decreased fibrinogen levels due to clot formation. Schistocytes will be present in about 10 to 20 percent of patients, and this is due to hemolysis, which can occur along with DIC. There is prolonged PT and APTT, and this is due to coagulation factors that are being used up when the clots are forming. There's also elevated D-dimer due to clot formation. The treatment for DIC will depend on the underlying cause and you need to treat that underlying etiology. Specifically for HELP syndrome, which is due to the peripartum clotting and bleeding, this will need to be treated with delivery of the infant. It's very important in DIC treatment to establish a baseline of platelet count, PT, APTT, D-dimer, and fibrinogen. So it's important to look back at previous labs and to continue to compare labs over time. Supportive treatment for DIC includes giving blood products, and this is for very significant bleeding. This can include platelet transfusions, cryoprecipitate, fresh frozen plasma, or packed red blood cells. Thrombotic microangiopathies. This will be TTP and HUS. There are two thrombotic microangiopathies, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, and hemolytic uremic syndrome, or HUS. Each is characterized by thrombocytopenia, which is caused by multiple thrombi in the microvas microvasculature, or small vessels, and they also have hemolytic anemia, and this is due to the ripping apart of red blood cells as they work their way through the fibrin networks of these thrombi. The clots are basically shearing the red cells apart. The causes of thrombotic microangiopathies include idiopathic TTP, which is caused by a deficiency in a gene that makes the metalloproteinase, and this results in ischemia and dysfunction of multiple organs. There is also a secondary TTP, it can be related to pregnancy. Can also have this with certain cancers, stem cell transplants, HIV patients, and with different drugs. HUS is a little bit different in that it's usually caused by some sort of diarrheal illness, specifically different types of E. coli, and it's especially seen in children. And in the HUS, the damage is caused by toxins, so usually a diarrheal illness with a toxin, but could be other illness that causes this toxin, but predominantly in children.
Clinical features for thrombotic microangiopathies. There is a pen tab that is used to help remember the clinical features for TTP and HUS, and it's listed below for you, but I am gonna rewrite it in another form using an acronym to help you try and remember what those clinical features are. I did wanna clarify ahead of time that I did not make up this acronym. This is a commonly used acronym that people use for medical studies. And this acronym is FAT, RN, F for fever, A for anemia, specifically hemolytic anemia, T for thrombocytopenia, R for renal insufficiency, and N for neurologic abnormalities. So this may be a better way for you to remember that pentad. In TTP, most patients will also have the neurologic issues and will have little to no renal insufficiency. In HUS, all patients will have the renal insufficiency and only about half of them will have the neurologic symptoms. So that's why it's helpful to divide up these two portions to remember that some of them may not be there if they're below the line. I like to remember that in HUS there's a toxin involved and that helps me to remember that they're always gonna have the renal insufficiency for HUS because there's a toxin and it affects the kidneys. Laboratory findings in thrombotic microangiopathies. For the CBC, you will see a thrombocytopenia you may also see on a peripheral smear that there are schistocytes or possibly reticulocytes. And these will both indicate that there's hemolysis occurring. Schistocytes are seen in hemolysis due to the broken red blood cells and reticulocytes are released in hem hemolytic anemia because the bone marrow is compensating for the lost red cells. In the chemistry, you will see increased creatinine, especially if this is a case with HUS where you have renal insufficiency. You can also see increased LDH and it increased indirect bilirubin due to the hemolysis. You may see hemoglobinemia as well due to the increased hemolysis or hemoglobinuria or hemoglobin in the urine due to the increased hemolytic uh, red blood cells. Stool cultures may be positive for E. coli, especially if you're dealing with patients that have HUS. And routine coagulation studies such as PT and APTT will be normal because these patients are having a platelet destruction issue and not a factor issue. Treatment of thrombotic microangiopathies. The first line treatment of TTP often will involve emergent plasma phoresis, especially if this is an idiopathic TTP, which is caused by the gene mutation. That is because there's antibodies that form in the blood and lead to this formation of clots, so the plasmapheresis will remove those antibodies. Other patients will receive red blood cell transfusions, especially if they have a clinically significant anemia. Patients will also receive hemodialysis if they have significant renal impairment, such as is seen in HUS. Some other second-line treatments could include rituximab, IVIG, corticosteroids, splenectomy, or other chemotherapeutics. A platelet transfusion is contraindicated in patients with thrombotic microangiopathies, and that is because there are all these little microvascular thrombosis, and the platelets would continue to aggregate to that area. It is important to make sure that treatment is done as soon as possible for both TTP and HUS, as there is a 90% mortality if patients are not treated. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a low platelet count that develops within five days of being treated with heparin therapy. This occurs because IgG antibodies are made against the platelet factor four, which is on the platelet. This leads to the destruction of those platelets. The clinical diagnosis of this is more than 50% loss of platelets from their baseline after starting heparin. And the definitive diagnosis is made by a positive platelet factor IV heparin antibody test. And this is done mostly by ELISA testing. In these patients, after they have started to have a thrombocytopenia and moved into the diagnosis of HIT, they have about a 50% chance of getting a clot within the 30 days after that. So it's very important to watch them closely. 
Initial treatment will involve discontinuing the heparin. They will have serial duplex Doppler ultrasounds to make sure that they are being checked for blood clots. The patients will be immediately started on a drug thrombin inhibitor, and then they will be later transferred to solely warfarin once they are therapeutic on the warfarin. It's also very important these patients to monitor their platelet levels closely. Disorders of coagulation factors. These will include von Willebrand's disease and hemophilias. First, we will discuss von Willebrand's disease. Von Willebrand's disease is the most common inherited bleeding disorder, although it still affects a very small amount of the population. And many of those do not have any symptoms, so they don't even know that they have the disorder. Von Willebrand's disease involves a deficiency of the von Willebrand factor, which is involved in primary hemostasis. This will typically present with mucocutaneous bleeding, and that'll include things such as menorrhagia, epistaxis, bruising easily, bleeding from the tooth after extractions, or gastrointestinal bleeding. There are three main types of von Willebrand disease, and they're divided into type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 1 von Willebrand's disease is about 80% of the cases, the majority of the cases, and this is an issue with a quantitative decrease in von Willebrand factor. So there is an actual decrease in von Willebrand factor itself. The von Willebrand factors that are there do function normally, and they these patients tend to have mild to moderate bleeding. Type 2 von Willebrand's disease is about 15 to 20% of cases, and this is more of a qualitative issue or a qualitative deficiency. So there's not necessarily a decreased amount of von Willebrand factors, but the von Willebrand factors that are there do not function properly. Well, type 2 von Willebrand disease is divided further into 2A and 2B, and 2M and 2N. 2A and 2B both have qualitative defects in the actual molecule of the von Willebrand factor itself. And you may also see a thrombocytopenia along with 2B. Type 2M and type 2N, one von Willebrand disease, has an issue with the von Willebrand factors being able to bind. If you have type 2M, you may also see that there's an issue with the factor 8 and its decreased binding as well. And with factor 2N, there is decreased binding to platelets as well. In type 3 von Willebrand's disease, this is a very rare variation. It is autosomal recessive, and the patient has virtually no von Willebrand factors and can have very severe bleeding starting at birth. Laboratory diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease. In general, the platelet count for patients with von Willebrand's disease will be normal. The exception to this is type 2B von Willebrand's disease, which has a thrombocytopenia associated with it. The PT and the APTT are generally normal for patients with von Willebrand's disease. The only exception to this is patients with type 2M von Willebrand's disease will also have a deficiency in factor 8. And because of this deficiency in factor 8, they will also have a prolonged APTT. There are some screening tests as well for von Willebrand's disease. The von Willebrand's factor antigen test will be decreased, as well as the von Willebrand's factor activity test will be decreased. The factor eight activity will often be decreased, especially in type 2M. And von Willebrand's factor multimere distribution, the multimere is absent in type three and decreased or absent in type 2A and type 2B. Treatment of von Willebrand's disease. Most patients are treated for von Willebrand's disease with DDAVP, which is a vasopressin often given by a nasal spray. The DDAVP causes the release of von Willebrand factors and factor eight from endothelial stores to build up the patient's supply of both von Willebrand factor and factor eight. This is often given to patients with von Willebrand's disease before minor procedures or if they have cases of minor bleeding. The typical patients who use DDAVP would be type 1 or type 2 von Willebrand's disease patients. Patients can also be given a von Willebrand factor containing factor 8 concentrate 
This is especially given to patients with type 2M because they have factor VIII deficiencies. And this is used for more severe bleeding or before a major procedure. There's also the option to give antifibrillinic therapies to prevent mucosal bleeding along with DDAVP for procedures such as dental procedures or tonsillectomies. Although von Willebrand's disease is typically inherited, there can be an acquired von Willebrand's disease. This will involve a new onset of bleeding without a family history of bleeding disorders or von Willebrand's disease. This can often be due to some sort of clonal hematoplurifative disorder, a malignancy, a cardiac defect, or it could possibly be autoimmune. It presents clinically similar to the hereditary von Willebrand's disease. Hemophilias. We will be discussing three hemophilias, but first we'll start with hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Hemophilia A is a deficiency of factor VIII. So if you see A, you should be thinking factor VIII. This is the most common bleeding disorder after von Willebrand's disease. If you see hemophilia B, you should be thinking deficiency of factor IX. And this is a little less common than hemophilia A. Both hemophilia A and B are X-linked recessive disorders, so they are seen mostly in male patients. A female patient could develop hemophilia if she was an offspring of a hemophiliac father and a mother who's a carrier. This, the clinical severity of hemophilias will vary depending on the level of the deficiency of factor VIII or factor IX. If they have less than 1% of the factors, they will have very severe hemophilia and have significant spontaneous bleeding. If they have between 1% to 5% of their factor activity, they will have moderate disease. And if they have greater than 5%, they will have mild hemophilia and usually only have problems after trauma or surgery. Clinical features of hemophilias. Patients with hemophilia will have bleeding, but it will depend on their severity of disease. As we spoke on the last slide, if they have less than 1% versus 1 to 5% or 5% of factor deficiency will dictate the severity of the disease. You'll first begin to suspect hemophilia in babies, and they may have either severe bleeding on circumcision or when they are first getting their teeth, they may have severe gum bleeding. If the patients have some sort of trauma, they may have bleeding after that, or it could be after surgery, or they could have bleeding spontaneously. The big diagnostic factors for these patients will be often a spontaneous hemarthrosis or bleeding into a joint or a muscle hematoma. So if you have a patient with either a spontaneous hemarthrosis or a muscle hematoma in a clinical vignette on an exam, or you see this on a patient, you should be thinking hemophilia. You will also occasionally see some GI bleeding in these patients. Laboratory testing for hemophilias. In hemophilias, you'll have a prolonged APTT. This is because you have a deficiency of either factor VIII or you have a deficiency of factor IX. Both are attested by the intrinsic pathway, which is tested for by the APTT. So it will be prolonged due to the deficiencies. The PT bleeding times and fibrinogen levels for patients with hemophilia will all be normal. And if you need a definitive diagnosis, you can do an assay for factor VIII or for factor IX, and it will obviously be low because they have a deficiency. The treatment of hemophilia should be done at a comprehensive hemophilia treatment center. First line treatment for patients with hemophilia A or hemophilia B will be a factor VIII or a factor IX infusion, and the amount of infusion that they will receive will depend on the severity of their disease. DDAVP, also called desmopressin, which is a vasopressin, can be given either by IV or intranasally for patients with hemophilia A, and this will help to increase the release of factor VIII. Often this is done prior to surgical procedures. Patients may also receive antifibrillinics before minor procedures if they have hemophilia A or B. The prognosis for patients with hemophilia can be variable and it will depend on their severity of their disease. They often will encounter disability from joint bleeding. And it's important to make sure that patients receive prophylactic factor replacement before they have any invasive treatments or procedures. Another hemophilia, hemophilia C, 
is a factor 11 deficiency. So if you see C, you should be thinking factor 11. This is autosomal recessive. There is mild bleeding with this disorder. It's usually only after post-operative issues. They do have a prolonged APTT, and that's again because factor 11 is part of the intrinsic pathway. And that's tested for again by the APTT. The treatment for patients with hemophilia C is typically either done by factor 11 concentrates, so they have the factor replacement, or they are given fresh frozen plasma, which would contain factor 11 as well. Hypercoagulable states. Hypercoagulable states, also called thrombophilias, they are divided into two portions, the inherited hypercoagulable conditions and the acquired hypercoagulable conditions. For inherited hypercoagulable conditions, the most common of all hypercoagulable conditions is factor V Leiden gene mutation. You can also have a prothrombin 20210A gene mutation. There are some deficiencies of clotting proteins, specifically antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C deficiency, or protein S deficiency. Elevated homocysteine levels can also contribute to increased hypercoagulable states, and elevated levels of fibrinogen or dysfunctional fibrinogen can be another inherited reason for clotting. There are several acquired hypercoagulable conditions that are divided by conditions caused by antibodies and other external causes. The antibody conditions include antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, anticardiolipin antibody syndrome, and antinuclear antibodies. External causes include cancer, recent trauma or surgery, a placement of a central venous line, obesity, pregnancy, and other sources of exogenous estrogen, such as oral contraceptive pills or hormone replacement therapy, and prolonged immobilization or bed rest. Hypercoagulable workup. Most systems will have a hypercoagulable panel, also called a thrombophilia, panel available. And below are the typical tests that you will see on those panels. So it's important to be familiar with those, but also be familiar with what the system you're working for uses. We're going to discuss a couple of the hypercoagulable states. We'll first talk about antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. This is, of course, as it says in the name, due to a autoantibody against phospholipids. And this causes both chronic issues with arterial and venous thrombosis and can also be a source of miscarriages, especially multiple miscarriages. The antibodies involved in this include the anticardiolipin antibody, the anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody, and lupus anticoagulant. These are diagnosed by doing assays for these antibodies or lupus anticoagulant testing. Let's discuss lupus anticoagulant further. Lupus anticoagulant is a source of recurrent thrombosis and repeated miscarriages in about 3% of the population. The name lupus anticoagulant is a misnomer, as when you see anticoagulant, you would think that it would cause less clotting, not more clotting. However, this has to do with how this was discovered. Before we talk about when it was discovered in the laboratory, let's first talk about what lupus anticoagulant does in the body. In the body, or in vivo, there's direct platelet activation and decreased production of prostaglandin 2, which leads to a hypercoagulable state. In vitro, or in the lab, there are no platelets or endothelium involved in the test. So there's, it interferes, the lupus anticoagulant interferes with the phospholipid complex assembly and actually causes an inhibition of coagulation, hence the name lupus anticoagulant. In these patients, you will see a prolonged APTT, and this is an issue that does not correct on a mixing study. Thank you for listening to the Hemostatic Disorders Lecture for the Hematology and Oncology Unit of the General Medicine course. Please be sure to complete your study guide in time for the application class session. If you have any questions regarding this lecture, please feel free to post them on the discussion board. Thank you.